Well, good morning. Welcome to our service this morning. I thought Carrie was going to play an introduction for me. <laughs> well, it's good to see each one of you here this morning. We want to welcome the ones that's watching by way of live stream also to our service this morning. So we're glad you're here. Uh, if you would uh, follow along in your bulletins, there's not many announcements this morning. Of course, don't forget about our normal services this uh, coming, uh, coming week. Of course, we'll have uh, choir practice tonight at 5 here at the church and in our evening service at 6. Uh, we invite all of you back out for our evening service tonight. Tuesday throughout the week, the, the men meet at 8.30 to have a prayer time here at the church. On Wednesday, of course, is our prayer and Bible study uh, and also the youth meet downstairs. And then Thursday at 10 is Mommy and me. And then, of course, then next Sunday uh, is our Sunday school and our morning worship service. And we'll do it all over again next Sunday. Uh, the ladies will be meeting on April the 20th. Uh, the theme is uh, Good Deed Doers. Uh, refreshments is going to be provided. So, uh, ladies, you're all incited. There is a sign-up sheet in the back there. Uh, but if you don't get a chance to sign up, please come out uh, anyhow for, that, for the ladies' tea next Saturday. Also, uh, I have a note here to read. It's not in your bulletin. Uh, Jamie Clark would like to meet with the the Bible school workers interested in helping with Bible school meals immediately following this morning worship service. So if you feel the Lord leading you to help with the meals for the vacation Bible school that's fastly coming our way, uh, please uh, meet up front here with uh, Jamie immediately following the morning worship service. Uh, one other note of thanks I'd like to read. It says, Dear Church family, thank you for all your kindness to my family this weekend. We enjoy being part of this special service. Thank you for the delicious meals, the comfortable lodging, and the helpful conversation. You are a blessing to us, and we thank God for you all. Love the Minion family to Brazil. Again, they were here with us in our uh, missionary conference and was glad to have them. They were quite a joy. So, Dan? Okay, well, it's nice to see everyone here this morning, see some new faces. I see some old faces. The, I see the fours back there. I haven't seen them for a number of years. She looks just as young as ever, <laughs> and I already told them this, but that's okay. Really great to have you with us. If you turn to 578, we're going to stand together, sing this classic hymn of the faith, How Firm a Foundation. As unto him, how firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said to you? Thus hath fled on number two. Fear not, I am with thee, O oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will still give thee aid, I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand upheld. shall lie my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply the flame shall not hurt thee I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to reap you're doing great on the last the soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell, shall
should endeavor to shake. I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Outstanding, you may be seated. Well, good morning. Great to see each one of you here today. Sorry, I just got distracted. There's an earring under the pulpit. We'll talk about that later. Um, I just have no idea where it came from. So if you're missing an earring, maybe this is it. So who knows? Anyway, welcome to a, uh, a little bit of what goes on in my brain. Just running off in all directions but it is good to see you you here this morning and uh, we praise the lord for this opportunity we have to gather and spend this time together worshiping the lord and looking into his word if you are visiting with us then uh you are very welcome and uh if you are a regular attendee then you're very welcome uh it's good to have jeff back again and just with his knee surgery and i heard today that uh he's, he's reached some level of fame apparently he is the poster boy for rehabilitation and so um, any questions about rehab speak to him i think he's only charging 75 dollars an hour and uh, he'll help you back to walk and write but uh, it is good that he's healing and doing well but continue praying for him our scripture reading this morning is going to be from uh, genesis chapter uh, 12 genesis chapter 12 if you have your bible and want to turn there uh, i'm going to begin reading in verse 1 and we're also going to be thinking about james chapter 2 verse 23 and we're picking back up on our series going through the record of the genesis account telling us about the origin of all things and we we've been away from it because of easter and uh, missions and various things going on but now we're kind of coming back to genesis and it's going to be kind of a mini series on the life of abraham and we're going to be focusing on this truth that abraham was a friend of god and that ought to be something we think about abraham is described as being the friend of God. And in Genesis chapter 12, we have the beginnings of this record. In verse 1, it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And so Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went out with him, and Abraham was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that had gotten in Haran, and they went forth into the land of Canaan, into the land of Canaan they came. And over in James chapter 2, verse 23, obviously written uh, many years later, uh, but uh, here we have this wonderful record where it says that the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Let's pray and seek the Lord's help today. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the beautiful sunshine. Lord, we thank you uh, for the opportunity to meet in this place. And Lord, I thank you for each one that is here. I ask, Lord, that you would grant them uh, a blessing from your word today. Lord, may the words I speak uh, be only those which are uh, ordained by you and, and, and supported by your word. Uh, Lord, I ask that you would challenge us if we need to be changed in some way, that you would be uh, the help and encouragement that some may need, the comfort that uh, some are looking for today. Lord, may we just have the spiritual needs of our hearts met. Uh, Lord, I pray for those who are absent from us, Lord, some who are sick, others who are working. We pray that you would be with them. Lord, those who are traveling, we ask you give them safety that we could soon see them uh, back with us lord we thank you most of all to, for uh, today for our savior jesus christ uh, lord for the penalty that he paid in our place lord that uh, because of him we may have our sins forgiven have the assurance that we're adopted into your family and lord as we've read of abraham that we might be known as your friends as your people and uh, lord help us as we consider these truths today bless our time together help us i pray in jesus holy name amen Continue singing hymn number 359, 359, Satisfied. All 
my life long I have panted for a drink from some cool spring that I hoped would quench the burning of the thirst I felt within. Hallelujah, I have found him whom my soul so long have craved. Jesus satisfies my longing. Through his blood I now am saved. Feeling on the husk of round me till my strength was almost gone. Long my soul for something better, only still the hunger on. Hallelujah, I have found it, what my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longings, by his blood I now am saved. Well of water ever springing, bread of life so rich and free, untold wealth that never faileth, my Redeemer is to me. Hallelujah, I have found it, what my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longing, by his blood I now am saved. Well, again, it's good to have you here. We have a special number this morning. The Wickens family is going to do a special number for you, and I'm sure you will enjoy it. Just a little cruise of oil was all she had to spare. Just a cup or two of flour to make a cake to share. Yet she gave it to the prophet. She gave it in God's name. And the little that she seemed to have was never quite the same. When you finally learn to give it up, no matter just how small, when you open up your hands to God, your life, your very the little that you seem to have will never be the same. Just a lunch of two small fishes and five small loaves of bread, yet he gave it to the master. How would the crowd be fed? the little that you seem to have will never be the same. When you finally learn to give it up, no matter just how small, when you open up your hands to God, your life, your very own, there's something that will 
Thank you, ladies, for that beautiful number. This time, I'll ask the ushers to come forward. Let's bow in prayer. Father, again, this morning, we want to thank you again that we have this opportunity to come and to worship you this morning. Father, our prayer would be that you'd be with each part of our service today. And Father, we just pray for this part of the service where we can give our tithes and our offerings and back to you. We trust with the heart of love for the many things that you provide for us uh, for our daily needs and father we just uh, thank you how you have blessed us and we ask for your continual blessing upon each one of us as we gather together and now ask all these things in thy name amen Six hundred, face to face we will sing. What an awesome thought it is that someday, if we're ready to meet the Lord, we're going to face him face to face. Together on the first. Face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face what will it be when with rapture I behold him Jesus Christ to die for me face to face I shall behold him far beyond the starry sky face in all his glory I shall see him by and by only faintly now I see him with the darkened veil between blood a blessed day is coming when his glory shall be seen face to face in all this told him far beyond the starry skies face to face in all his glory I shall see him by and by on the third 
What rejoicing in his presence when our banished grief and pain, when the crooked ways are straight and the dark things shall be plain. Face to face I shall behold him far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all his glory I shall see him by and by. Face to face, O oh blissful moment, face to face to see and know face to face with my redeemer jesus christ who loves me so face to face in all his glory far beyond the starry sky face to face in all his glory I shall see him by and by. Outstanding. Thank you. Well, again, it is good to see each of you here this morning. And we're going to begin in Genesis chapter 12. And then we'll be moving around a little bit in uh, to, to consider some other uh, texts that are connected with what we're looking at today. Uh, but I just want to read again in that first verse where in Genesis chapter 12, it describes that first meeting uh, between Abraham and God. So Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And we go down to verse 4, So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. Let's pray and then look to the Lord. Father, we ask again for your help today. I ask that you would guide us in all things. Father, we pray that you would be honored and glorified through uh, what we consider here from your word and that, Lord, you would work in our hearts. Lord, show us our need and help us to respond to you in obedience and faith. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you've heard of uh, any famous piano players. There's one that I wanted to tell you about a little bit to begin with this morning, but I don't know if I can say his last name. He's a Polish uh, piano player, and then he became a statesman, and his name was Jan Pat Paderis Paderiski. What they said. So, I can say Jan. So he was meant to leave his native Poland to play his first recital in London. He asked one of his uh, compatriots, a friend, to write him a letter of introduction should the musical world in London not open up to him. And as it happened, the, the envelope never had to be opened. He never had to give the uh, message to anyone. His debut was a success, and uh, everything was fine. And some years later, when he was going through his papers, he found the old envelope, and he opened it up to see what his friend had written. And it said this, this will introduce Jan Paderewski, who plays the piano for which he demonstrates no conspicuous talent. <laughs> and so years later, he found out that maybe that friend wasn't such a great friend after all. He had put his trust in someone, uh, but it had been, at least on that occasion, misplaced. And you know, this idea of friendship we find all the way through the Bible, and we sing what a friend we have in Jesus. But I know more often than not, I think of Jesus as he is described in the Bible as our Savior. I think of Jesus as God. We think of God the Father, the Spirit, the Son. Uh, you know, but how often do I think about God as my friend? And I don't know about you, how often you think of God as a friend. You know, in Abraham's situation, we're going to see that three times in the Bible, he's referred to as the friend of God. And you don't read that much. I, you know, you find it, I think, with Moses as well, in the sense that it says that Moses spoke with God as a man does with his friend. But that's emphasizing perhaps more the, the mode of communication rather than friendship, as we might think of it. We're going to see that Jesus said to the apostles that he would no longer call them servants, but friends. 
But have you thought about being the friend of God? And what does it mean to be the friend of God? We're going to consider that as we go into the message today. And I think it's something that we will uh, continue to see as we go through God's word. And we go through this kind of mini-series on the life of Abraham. Like I said, it's a part of Genesis. We've been working through Genesis for a while now. And so as we consider where we have come from, the story so far, we, you know, if you open up to Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, you know, what has happened, what's come before. Uh, And so if you consider Genesis chapter 1 and 2, it's all about the creation of the world. If you go by the biblical genealogy, uh, that would have been, you know, some 4,000 years B.C. In chapter 3, you go to the fall of humanity when Adam and Eve sin and the curse is brought into the world. Genesis 4 and 5, you see the lines of good and evil very much dividing. You see those who are followers of, uh, of the, the line of Seth, who have chosen to obey God, and then those who go in the way of Cain, and they are going their own way and rebelling against God. And ultimately, that results in Genesis 6 through 9, where you have the flood. The flood, again, if you go by biblical genealogies, as they're just written on the page, was around about 2,000 400 BC, let's say, just to round it off a little bit. Following the flood, you have the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10, and then the Tower of Babel. And then finally, you come to Abraham. And I'm going to mostly try and refer to him as Abraham until God changes his name to Abraham. But uh, more than likely, I'm going to alternate between the two. But then you come to Abraham, this figure who has become known as the friend of God. And as far as it is known, he was born around about 2100 BC, 2100 BC in Mesopotamia. Often he's referred to as being from Ur of the Chaldees, but the word Ur can simply mean land. So it may just mean land of the Chaldees. It may mean a specific city, uh, but Mesopotamia was that region. And so as we come up here to Genesis chapter 12, let's think first of all about the beginning of the friendship. Where did this friendship begin? Every now and again, somebody will put on Facebook, you know, share your memories below of how we first met. And you'll always get someone who likes to make a joke of it and say, who are you? And, uh, you know, more than once, that may have been actually me, especially if it's someone I know very well. You know, we all have those friends where we remember the first time we met. We remember how the friendship has developed. And sometimes it may be that you know someone, but you can't think exactly when you met. Maybe because of the the, the longevity of the friendship or whatever it may be. But how did Abraham's friendship with God begin? Like I said, he was born in Mesopotamia, a long way from Canaan, where his life would one day end. And he seemingly plucked out of obscurity. There doesn't seem to be any line uh, of of famous men or faithful people from which God chose him. When we go back to Genesis chapter 11, in verse 27, it says, now these are the generations of Terah. Now, as you go through Genesis, very often when you read, now these are the generations of, it's kind of signaling like a new chapter, a new book within the book. And he says, these are the generations of of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. Abraham and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah. And the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscar. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abraham, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, and his son Abraham's wife. And they went forth uh, with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, and they came unto Haran and dwelled there. And so you have this beginning, you have this uh, original move of this family going from somewhere in modern day Iraq, probably 150 miles northwest if you look at where the Persian Gulf is, uh, and they move as far as southwest Turkey. And there, uh, Abraham's father died. When you go to Acts and Hebrews 11, it's Abraham that is called. It's Abraham who is given that command to leave his family, his kindred, his land, and to go somewhere new. And so here it describes the many in the family who move in that direction, but it is Abraham who is the driving force. It is Abraham who is the one that God had given this command to. And so when we go into 
chapter 12, you have what is uh, has been known as the Abrahamic covenant. We're not going to talk about that today. We're going to look at that in detail another time. But Abraham is told to leave his country of Chaldea, his kindred, his father's house. And God was going to make of him something new, a new family. We, we had that principle in, in Genesis 1 and 2 and 3 where, uh, you know, a couple will leave father and mother and they become a new family, a new uh, kind of unique unit. They still have their ties with existing family members, but they become something unique in and of themselves. But Abraham was going to become something new as a family, but also new as one day a nation would come from him, and there would be this covenant that God had not made with any other human uh, family. I want you to think a little bit about the literal and figurative steps of faith that he took. And again, we're going to return to his faith at a later date. We'll look at it a little bit today in the context of his friendship, but just think for a moment about the faith that it took to leave a relatively comfortable surroundings as far as we know he wasn't driven out by enemies he didn't flee persecution he wasn't getting away from uh, famine or any type of suffering by all accounts the family was growing and everything was going well but Jehovah spoke to Abraham and said go somewhere else and some of you although it wasn't in the same situation you've made a new start you know what it's like to have lived one place and then lived in another. Uh, You know, I've lived in some very different places. England is very different to the United States in many ways. I've been to Bedford, England, and Bedford, England, apart from the name, is nothing like Bedford, Pennsylvania. I've visited Morocco, and Morocco is wildly different from anywhere else I've visited, apart from maybe Birmingham, England. Uh, Birmingham visit one day and you'll understand but it's very different from most of the united kingdom most anywhere else in the world the south of france i've been to now i haven't you know vacationed lots of places these are places i've taken trips to go and preach and do other things the south of france is very different it's not like many other places that i've been to you know but it's one thing in our day and age where we have translation tools and you have maps and you know when i drove through marseille some of the worst roads in the world and it's this tunnel system going over that going under the ancient city and if you imagine getting stuck on the interstate and how frustrating that is imagine getting stuck in a tunnel you know it's just a little bit more concerning abraham though couldn't look on google and say what's the weather today in canaan he couldn't email ahead and, you know, write to the, the visitor bureau of, of Canaan and say, hey, I'm moving into the area. What's the housing situation like? He, he couldn't write ahead to the local sheriff and say, hey, sheriff, what's the crime like in your town? He went out by faith. He went out essentially blind, trusting God. And although most of you will probably, most of us will never be in a situation where literally we'll have to uproot and go somewhere where we don't know perhaps the language or the terrain or anything about it, there are steps of faith that God will call you to take in your life. And every step of faith, if it's your step of faith, it is a big step of faith. I'm not going to say to you, uh, if I ever do, then, you know, tell me I'm wrong. But I ought never say to you, well, that's easy. Just, just go for it. Because your step of faith is the challenge in your life. That new experience, that new endeavor, that thing that you've never done before, or the thing that God's calling you to do again, if it's your step of faith, then that takes faith. It takes trust. I don't care whether you're taking a a step into the unknown and and the canyon below is a thousand feet down or it's 10 feet down. That is your step of faith. They are your risks. It's your unknown. And that is something which if God is leading you to it, you can make that choice to believe. Abraham was told here, get out of thy country from thy kindred, from thy father's house unto a land I will show thee. And then verse 4 Abraham departed. You know, I see echoes of that in Mark chapter 16 with the Great Commission. I love sometimes how you see these things uh, just, you know, summarized in the account. And in Mark chapter 16 
and in verse 15, Jesus said unto them, go you into all the world and preach the gospel, verse 20, and they went. And, you know, I I know there were probably hugs and goodbyes, and I know there were maybe logistical things that had to take place, but God said, go, and they went. Abraham was told by God, go, and Abraham went. The disciples were told, go, by Jesus, and they went. What is Jesus telling you to do? What is the Lord commanding you to do in your life? And think of this in the context of a friend saying to you, and I understand he's Lord and he's friend, he's God and Savior. Uh, You know, we're we're joint heirs with Christ and there's that sense in which we're his brother. But he's saying to you to do something, to, to witness, to, you know, take some step of obedience. And ultimately it comes down to to faith. The beginning of Abraham's friendship with God is found when God made promises to Abraham and Abraham chose to believe. Uh, We, uh, again, using the genealogies, if the flood took place around about 2400 BC, Abraham born about 2100 BC, you know, we don't know what had taken place in that time frame exactly. But we don't know the spiritual connections that Abraham may have had. We, we can look at some of the lifespans and guess who may have still been alive. But Abraham's step of faith was amazing. But it's that reason that is so great an example for us. We have so many reasons to believe. If you ask me today, why should I trust in God? Why should I trust Jesus? I can give you thousands of reasons I could give you so many reasons why. I could give you solid, substantial reasons to believe the Word of God and to look at church history to see what God has done. I can give you personal reasons about things that God has done for me when I know that He's answered my prayers. I can give you reasons to believe. Abraham couldn't go to someone else and say, hey, you know what, I'm thinking of doing this thing. What do you think? Have you heard of Jehovah? Uh, You know, what, what do you think I should do? But he chose to believe. Therein lies the beginning of this friendship. And when you go to several other passages that we're going to look at now, you'll see that his, his trust, his faith, his obedience are always connected with him being called the friend of God. So this is the beginning of his friendship. Let's look at some of the blessings of the friendship. If we go over to Second Chronicles chapter 20, Second uh, Chronicles 20 and verse 1, many hundreds of years later, when the nation promised has finally become established. Hebrews 11 said that Abraham died not having seen the promises fulfilled, but he still believed every bit as much as when God made the promise, if not more so. In Second Chronicles chapter 20, I'm going to read from verse 1. We're going to go down as far as verse 7. I want you to see that this idea of being the friend with God wasn't a New Testament invention. It wasn't a reading back into the Bible, something that was never there. Because a lot of people like to say that the Old Testament is different from the New. And there are differences, I understand that. But God is the same God. And in Second Chronicles 20 verse 1, it says, It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab, the children of Ammon, and with them also beside the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. And then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There comes a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria, and behold, they be in Hazazonatamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim the fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court, And he said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven, and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thy hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? Art not thou our God, who did drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gave it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend, forever? It's an amazing thing that happens here, and we talked about this a few months ago, I think, when the choir sang a piece called Send Out the Singers, because Jehoshaphat is faced with a battle that, humanly speaking, he could not win. It's amazing how many times down through, uh, you know, those thousands of years, Israel has faced an impossible fight, and yet they remain. 
and here is one of those occasions and uh, the, the answer God gives essentially is you're not going to have a fight. You're going to win. I'm going to fight the battle for you. And when the enemy approaches Jerusalem the next day, uh, Jehoshaphat goes out with the, the armies and he says, he remembers and he says, you know what? God said we're not going to have to fight. And in verse 20, it says, in verse 21, he says, send out the singers. You know, how would you have liked that? If you've got this army with swords and shields and you've got all these trained men of war and then Jehoshaphat says, send out the singers in front of them. It's like, can I sing behind them? Like, the guys with the weapons, can they stand in front of me, in front of the other guys with weapons? But Jehoshaphat was showing them, look, God said he was going to save us. And so they sent out the singers, and the singers sang, and the battle was won. Jehoshaphat took a step of faith. But upon what was that faith based? It was based upon the promises God had made to Abraham. And in verse 7, he goes to God, he, he gets on his knees before him, and he prays, you know, basically save us because you told Abraham that this land would be his and his descendants forever. And he says, Abraham, your friend. It's not a New Testament concept. It's not something that we're trying to read back into it. It's right there. The blessings of the friendship were such that the descendants of Abraham could go before God and say, God, you made this promise to your friend Abraham, and now we need your help. Uh, if you would, go over to Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41, you know, Isaiah is a, an amazing book, and there are some, uh, you know, blessed coincidences, you might say, about it in the layout of the chapters. Isaiah 40 and onwards are very much about the hope that Israel could have, the blessings that would one day be theirs again in the land of Israel. In Isaiah 41 verse 8, it's not Israel saying, God help us because you promised you would, but it's God saying, I will bless you because I promised I would. In Isaiah 41 verse 8, it says, but thou Israel art my servant, Jacob whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. It's a theme we see running through the Bible. And it's a theme that although some of the descendants of Abraham maybe didn't believe, it's a theme that maybe some of the descendants of Abraham, they uh, emphasized the law over God's uh, other revelations. But still there were those who would say throughout Israel's history, Abraham, the friend of God. There were so many blessings that came to Israel because Abraham was the friend of God. And sometimes there are blessings with being in proximity to people who are friends. Isn't that right? Not all Israel may be believed, but many in Israel were blessed despite those who were next to them. Now, we can't be saved on behalf of someone else, and our faith can't save someone else. But here we have in Israel the blessings because Abraham was the friend of God down through the generations, the people of Israel claiming it, and God himself reminding them and saying, I will bless you because I was the friend of Abraham. It hasn't happened to me often that I've gone somewhere and someone said, oh, you're a friend of so-and-so, come on in. You know, it has been one or two occasions where, you know, I knew somebody who was a good friend with someone else, and they were like, oh, you're, you're so-and-so's friend. You should have said, jump to the front of the line. You know, in human terms, those connections are limited, aren't they? I went to a conference once, and the host of the conference was good friends with a good friend of mine, even though I'd never met him. And when I got there, they said, oh, you're friends with so-and-so? We, we saved you a seat on the front row. Come down. It's reserved for you. And I'm like, okay. I wasn't expecting that because the general rule of this conference was we do not reserve seats. And I get there and there were reserved seats. There was a friend of mine with me who wasn't a friend of the other guy. And they hadn't reserved seats for him. And so as a good friend, I said, I'll meet you afterwards. <laughs> uh, when I got my reserved seats. <laughs> I am not the model for friendship. <laughs> but we did get dinner afterwards and everything was okay. Humanly speaking, there are limitations 
to those friendship connections. But you know what? Those who are descendants of Abraham, those who obeyed the, the commands that God had given and met God on the terms that he had set, they could be known as the friend of God as well. You know, Paul the Apostle, many years later, found himself on the outside of the blessings of a friendship with God because he was trying to earn his way into God's favor. He was trying to keep all of the rules that God had set so that he could be brought into some kind of relationship with God. And ultimately, he had to come to understand that it was nothing that he could do to be made the friend of God by his own merit and by his own deeds. He could only become the friend of God through the free gift of salvation that Jesus Christ would offer. And in that friendship with God, Paul found all of the blessings. He found all of the, 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 the many promises made being fulfilled. And we could talk about all the ways that Israel have been blessed and all the ways that Paul the Apostle was blessed, all the ways that I've been blessed by knowing God is my Savior and, and being a friend of God in the sense that he calls us to be his friend. But ultimately, the greatest blessing of friendship with God is being the friend of God. He's adopted me into his family, and I can say that I'm a son of God, but that's something that is, you know, a part of the blessing of being in relationship with him. There are the blessings of, of being able to pray. There are the blessings of the promises of God. There's the blessing of the assurance of what's going to happen when I die. But ultimately, what it comes down to is I get to know God. The Westminster Confession, it famously uh, summarizes the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And Solomon in Ecclesiastes long before the Westminster Confession in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, would say, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. The blessings of knowing God are innumerable, and sometimes we can focus on the secondary blessings, but the primary blessing of being the friend of God is that we can be the friend of God. But what is the basis of that friendship? I spoke about it a little bit there, but let's go over to James chapter 2 and verse 23, and we'll tie it together. You know, if the Bible says something once, that's sufficient. When you find something repeated, and especially when you find it repeated across different sections and different types of writings, some of them historical, some of them prophetical, others uh, poetical. James is, uh, you know, kind of a, a book that is given to us, Proverbs. And, uh, you know, when you find it spread across all of those areas, in my mind, that's really emphasizing something. And in James chapter 2, verse 23, it says, The scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. God's, the basis for his friendship with God is that God made a promise and Abraham believed him. And when I first started thinking about this, and I've thought about it in the context of John 15, and we may go there in a moment as well, but Jesus says to them, if you love me, keep my commandments. And it's in that same context where he says that he wouldn't, you know, refer to them as servants, but as friends. And sometimes in my mind, I wrestled with that. I was like, well, what kind of friendship is it where one gives commands to another? That does seem more like a servant than a friend. And what kind of friendship is it where one says, if you love me, do what I say? But you know, there's something else that's going on there. And I just, for some reason, had never made the connection before. Here, Abraham believes God, it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. And it comes down to this, Abraham trusted God. And isn't that at the heart of friendship? Trust? Now, in John 15, I'm going to read that because I think it does um, help tie it all together. In John 15 and verse 11, Jesus is preparing the disciples for his uh, crucifixion and then ascension, and the Holy Spirit will be sent in his place. And in John 15, verse 11, he says, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. 
this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no, has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. And like I said, I struggled with that. You're my friends if you do what I tell you to do. But he said, henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord uh, doeth. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my father, I have made known unto you. And this is the heart of what's going on here. He says, if you trust me, you'll trust what I'm telling you. And if you act upon that, then that proves you're my friends. Obedience is based upon trust, and trust is essential in friendship. If I love Jesus, then I will trust him. And if I trust him, I will trust that he knows best, and I will obey him. And so this cycle is then complete. If I love him, I trust him. If I trust him, I do what he says. If I trust him, he's my friend, and so I love him, and so on it goes. Trust is at the heart of friendship. And so when Abraham trusted God, God found someone that he could call his friend. I I don't believe that God was, you know, running around Mesopotamia looking for someone and saying, do you trust me? No. Okay, well, what about you? Do you trust me? No. Okay, finally, I found someone that's going to trust me and be my friend. I think God knew the heart of everyone and he knew that Abraham would choose to trust. It's not unique that there would be a very small number respond to God. Isn't that exactly what happened in the days of Noah? So we make a choice. You know, in James chapter 4 and verse 4, it says that adulterers and adulteresses know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God, and whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. The world system which is anti-God, which is contrary to Scripture. And again, it comes down to trust. Are we going to trust what God says or are we going to trust something else? And therein lies the basis of the friendship. It's all by the grace of God. It's all simply a response to God. Abraham did no works. And that's what James is really emphasizing in that context. Long before the sign of the covenant was given to the family of Abraham, Abraham believed God. And was considered the friend of God. Long before Moses would be born. And the law would be given. Abraham believed God. And it was imputed to him for righteousness. Imputed means that it was, you know, in essence credited to his account. He didn't earn it, deserve it, trade or bargain for it. He simply believed. That's exactly what Paul teaches us in Ephesians 2. For by grace are you saved through faith. And what is faith? It's an active trust, an active belief, whereby we say, God, you said this, I trust you, I believe you. I put my faith in you. Hebrews 11 says that he, uh, that uh, without faith it's impossible to believe God. Uh, for he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that seek him. So you've got to believe in God to begin with, but then you've got to believe in the promises of God, that God said, if you come to me in the name of my son, Jesus, then you'll be forgiven, you'll be received and accepted. That whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so all friendships are based upon trust. And our friendship with God is based upon his faithfulness to us, his faithfulness to us and our choosing to trust him. And so now think about ourselves. If I think about myself and I think, you know what? Have I been a good friend to God? Am I a good friend to him? The beginning of the friendship we saw, God reached out to Abraham. And in the same way, God reaches out to us. In Matthew 11, 28, he says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Who does that appeal go out to? Do you labor and are you heavy laden? Do you feel the weight of sin and that desire to to know God? Well, then you're invited to know him. In Acts 16, 31, it says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Our friendship, our relationship with God begins when we come to him for salvation. Jesus said, Greater love is no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And yet Jesus laid down his life for his enemies. 
Do you need to begin a friendship with God today by recognizing him as your savior, receiving that free gift of salvation? There are the blessings of the friendship, as we noted with Abraham. We'll discover that those blessings were numerous. I believe that we gain so much when we become the friends of God, when we become his children and recipients of peace and love and joy and so much else. But the primary blessing of being the friend of God is simply knowing God and consider, do we give thanks to God more when secondary blessings are around? And I know it's difficult. None of us are perfect. We're all going to have those times when we're just like, oh, man, I want this day to end. You know, I, I'm just ready to just to go to sleep and then start again tomorrow. You know, sometimes those trials go on for a while. And, you know, with, with no kind of terrible intent, but sometimes you may wake up in the morning and go, oh, no. Can I go back to bed yet? It's like you haven't got out of bed yet. You know, you can't go back if you haven't got up yet. And you just think, I just need to get through the day. You know, sometimes when everything's going great, we're much more ready to praise God. But when we're friends with God, there ought to be a basis which goes beyond that. A basis by which he's our friend and we praise him always. And the blessings are secondary. We see that as being something which comes after. But what kind of a friend are you to God? And like I said, the basis of the friendship comes down to this, faith. God's promise, God's grace, God's unending goodness towards us. But have you responded in faith and trust and received it? Essentially, this morning, are you the friend of God? Or are you the friend of the world? If you don't know that you could say you're God's friend because your sins are forgiven and heaven is your home, then that's where you need to begin today without delay. That's where everything starts. And as with Abraham, there's going to be so much more that happens. A whole new adventure, a whole new life is going to begin. But Abraham couldn't enjoy any of that until he got away from where he began. And he made that new start, that new life in God. Do you need to begin that walk with the Lord today? And if you do know that Christ is your Savior and you know that you're a child of God, then have you been a good friend to him this week? Have you ever been the friend that's been embarrassed by someone else or been embarrassed? Someone else has been embarrassed by you. You get the word in right. I've told you before, there was someone in England once that I saw and I said, hello, and they went, who are you? And they knew exactly who I was. But they were embarrassed by me. Believe it or not. And, you know, on that occasion, I didn't really care all that much. It wasn't someone that was a close enough friend that I kind of felt cut by it. But have you been a good friend to the Lord? Have you been a good friend of God? As we go to prayer now, as we sing a final hymn, let's think about our standing before the Lord. And let's think about the blessing that is. How incredible is it that someone was called the friend of God numerous times? We, again, I don't think we emphasize it much, and maybe it's because we're trying to avoid, and I think it is, some over-familiarity with the Creator, Sovereign of the universe, but we sing to Him, what a friend we have in Jesus. And Jesus said, I will no longer call you servants, but friends, because I'm going to tell you everything the Father's told me. Are you the friend of God? What kind of friend have you been to Him this week. Let's close with a word of prayer and then we will um, be finished for the morning. Lord, I thank you for the day and I thank you for the example of Abraham. And I thank you most of all for you, our great God and Savior. And I thank you that because of Jesus Christ, we can know our sins are forgiven and one day heaven will be our home. And I thank you that in this life, we can know that fellowship with you, that friendship with you. And like Paul, we would say we are your servants and we will do what you tell us to do. But at the heart of it, we trust you, we believe you, and you have called us friend. Help us, Lord, I pray. Meet our needs. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would stand with me, turn to hymn number 497. 497. 
We will sing the first three verses of Search Me, O God. self and pride I now surrender Lord in me abide. thank you for your attendance and attention this morning great to have you all here I hope you'll enjoy this beautiful day hope that you'll come back whenever you're able to do so and uh ask you to bow now in prayer. Our final hymn will be sung on 387 after our prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for the day, and I thank you for all the miracles that you have done in our life. You've given us everything we need, and we are so grateful for that, Lord. But Lord, today we come with you to you with a request for you to help us, Lord. Help us to guide in each step that we take in this life. May it be something that's fulfilling for not only us, but it's pleasing to you, Lord. I pray that we might seek your will and that we might, uh, as we come in contact with folks that never have heard the truth of the gospel, that we might be willing to pass that wonderful information that can change not only their life here on earth, but for all of eternity. I ask that you bless each and every person here today, that as we depart this place, that you keep us safe and bring us back at the next appointed time. We'll give you the honor and the praise for all these things that you do for us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We'll sing the chorus of He Lives. Together. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth. Just because he lived. God bless you.